yes into the chat. And we have about 725 people registered for this webinar today, which is absolutely wonderful. And we have so much good information, so I'm so, so excited you're here. We're going to give people just a second to get in. Thank you so much. You guys are overwhelmingly responsive. I love it. I love when people participate in webinars. Um, I can't stand when someone is just talking at people. And so I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions and getting people involved. And the reason why is because we have such a wonderful group of clinicians in today. And you have really good feedback as well on assessments. And so I want to hear that feedback. And I, I want you to openly share in the comments section. And we will definitely have a question and answer. Uh, but we're going to be going through a lot of assessments today. So while we're waiting for folks to get in, if you don't mind sharing where you're from, I'll tell you, my name is October Boyles, and I am from Charlotte, North Carolina, born and raised um, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So if you don't mind sharing kind of where you're from, and if you if you, if you you don't mind, you it, it might be helpful um, to the webinar if you don't mind sharing your discipline. That you don't you're not you don't have to share either <laughs> so but if you don't mind that'd be great uh we've got folks okay all over the place georgia tennessee michigan kansas colorado excellent texas massachusetts wow we've got psychologists social workers counseling directors that's wonderful. Ohio, great. I've got people private messaging me. Las Vegas, Florida. Oh, I wish I was in Florida right now. North Carolina is a bit chilly, so slightly jealous. Canada, you know what? Carol, I can't complain. Can, can I? Nope, can't complain. <laughs> so British Columbia, fantastic. Wonderful. Montana, New Jersey. Excellent. So good to have you guys in here today. So, so wonderful. So wonderful. So we are going to be going over a lot of information, a lot of information today. And I think, I hope that it's going to be really helpful uh, to you. So what I want is we're going to be discussing a, a comprehensive list of over 60 different assessments that are commonly used in the field of mental health. And we're going to go over a wide range of mental health conditions, and that could include depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, ADHD, and more. And so, and we're going to, what I'm going to do is I'll provide you a overview of each assessment. We'll talk about the purpose of the assessment, the administration of the assessment, and what's the most popular. And I'm really fortunate because I work for an electronic medical record, right? I can notes. And we have a large customer base across the United States and also in other countries. So we're able to gather information on the most widely used assessments. And we're going to discuss the importance of selecting an appropriate assessment for each individual and the benefit of using these standardized assessments in behavioral health practice. So I hope this is going to be informative and useful for you all because um, I want it to you already have a great amount of knowledge, but I want it to enhance that. And we're just going to go over all of these assessments in a limited period of time. So I need you to buckle up, okay, because we're going to go fast. We're just going to be thorough, but we're going to be fast with this, okay? All right. Now, a couple things. I just want to get some housekeeping stuff out of the way. This is being recorded. I am hoping we are recording it right now, I believe. So someone has hit that record button. And so we are recording this. And we also have handouts for you. So after this webinar, you will get the recorded video. So if you have to go, if you're like, look, I have patients that are coming in, whatever it is, or clients, not a problem. Okay, this is going to be recorded. We'll get it sent out to you. And then also we have handouts for you. So we have a couple really cool handouts. One, you're going to get a handout on my slides. So don't worry about that. You've got, you're going to have that. And you're also, we're going to send you a big list, a much bigger list um, of assessments. So, and I believe that's in the handout section, and, and I'll, we'll also post it in the chat at, right as soon as we're finished with the webinar. 
And so, and this list gives you all of the assessments in the different categories, the date of the creation of the assessment, whether it is clinician administered or patient or client, like self-administered scale. So a lot of good information in that list. And, and so, I, but again, today in the 60 that we're gonna get, be going over, it's just going to be on all different categories. And I think it, it, it'll be really helpful. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to post them in. And we're gonna have, we're actually gonna have a question and answer session at the end. So we will get to that, okay? All right. So I really I want to talk a little bit about the history of mental health assessments. I always like to talk about the history of things because it dates back centuries. And it's difficult to actually pinpoint the exact first mental health assessment ever used. But the earliest forms of mental health assessments was developed by the ancient Greeks who believed that mental illness was caused by an imbalance of your body fluids, okay? And there's a well-known Greek physician who created personality classifications based on these imbalances in your fluids. And he had four different personality types. And it was used, this system was used for centuries. And it was even referenced by notable figures like Shakespeare referenced this. And so they just kind of took it as gospel that this is what it was um, and in the assessment. So, but in the modern era, the first standardized mental health assessment tool was um, an intelligence test. And it was developed in 1905. And the test was actually designed to identify children with intellectual disabilities. And it's been since evolved into a widely used IQ test. And now when we talk about the first diagnostic manuals, like the statistical manual for use of institutions for the terminology was the insane, not a word that we like to use, right? But that was published in the United States in 1918 and included detailed descriptions of various mental illness and symptoms. And since then, <laughs> numerous mental health assessments have been developed and been redefined to help clinicians diagnose and treat mental health conditions. So when we're talking about identifying mental health issues, mental health issues can mental health assessments can help identify mental health issues that the patient may be experiencing. And you can use this information to diagnose a mental health disorder and create a personalized treatment plan that addresses the patient's unique needs. And you can also evaluate the severity of symptoms because these assessments will let you know the severity of the patient's symptoms. Most of them have numerical scales on them. So if the patient is experiencing really severe symptoms, then you may recommend, you know, it may actually form the way you treat them, right? Am I going to see them outpatient or do we need partial hospitalization? Do we need hospitalization? Um, it, all of these things, it kind of determines sometimes with these assessments level of care. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And it really determines the best course of treatment. So what is it we're doing right now? Is it a combination of therapies or do we need to do CBT, medication, lifestyle changes? What are we doing as far as best course of treatment? And again, these mental health assessments, they will serve as a guide to you. You are the clinician. So we have a lot of wonderful clinicians in here, a variety of disciplines. So, and you as the clinician are actually making the diagnosis, but these just help you kind of serve as a guide, right? Um, and it can also help you monitor progress because a lot of these assessments absolutely have the numerical scale. We can see how the, the individual is doing with that numerical scale, okay? All right. Now I wanna make sure, I just always check the chat to make sure everybody's great. Now, um, and I've got some questions already, like I don't see a certain thing on the list. There, um, there are over a thousand mental health assessments. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about the reason we're going over some of the ones today. All right, um, the, and, and I, I'm going to, and I don't want to get on a tirade on this because I can, and because it, it's something that irks me a little bit. And after I explain it to you, I think you'll feel, you may feel very similar. Um, but there are a lot of mental health assessments out there now that are being, that you have to pay for. 
right? And I don't always particularly feel that that is in the best interest of one, the clinician, and, and not in the best interest of the patient because some of those assessments out there are really good. But there have been large companies that have come in and kind of gobbled up these copyrights of even older assessments. So all of the assessments that I am going to show you today are open domain, meaning you can use them and you won't get in trouble. And what happens is a lot of clinicians are using assessments that are actually copyrighted and don't know it and, and and don't know it. And so that's one of the things that's really important because we don't want you to be in copyright violation. So all of the assessments that I'm going to be going over today are open domain assessments. So, and so they may not be the brightest and the newest and the, the hottest out there right now. Um, but every single assessment that I will go over um, is valid it's reliable and it has evidence-based studies to back it up, okay? Every single one. Now, there are some assessments out there that are really popular that people are doing that don't have good validity. They just don't. And, and so I'm not gonna be talking about any of those today. I'm going to be talking about assessments that have been proven in studies, they're evidence-based, they're reliable, um, they're interoperable, they have good interreliability, which means interreliability means like, let's take for example, that I do the assessment and then uh, Herb, you do the assessment and we get basically the same scale. So that's, that's what that, that means. And so, those are the assessments that I'm going to be highlighting today. So, and there are so many. So if you're, if you've come to this saying, I'm a little bit overwhelmed with all the assessments out there and I really don't know what to use. Um, at, these are a very good guideline and I'll explain why for each one. Okay. Now, these are some of the choosing the right mental health assessment. These are some of the key considerations in it. Like the purpose, what's it for? right? Is it for depression, anxiety, personality disorders, trauma? It's, it's critical or crucial that you select the assessment that is appropriate for your patient population or the patient that needs this particular assessment. One, validity, huge on validity. There's got to be strong evidence that ensures that the results of this are accurate and reliable. And reliability, we talked a little bit about that. It's the consistency of the assessment results, okay? If that means it's going to yield similar results if the same person multiple times administered or was done by different clinicians, okay? And accessibility, again, why I did, it, it, what is it? Is it the cost? What's the training required for this assessment? things like that. And then also what I think is really important is cultural sensitivity. It's important to choose an assessment that's culturally sensitive to the appropriate um, population being assessed. So you're considering in fa factors like language, and we'll talk a little bit about that with these assessments, cultural beliefs and, and values. So one of one of the really, really important things. So, and that's cultural sensitivity is really the big main focus of the DSM-5, right? The TR that came out. So that's huge focus there. Um, one of the things when we start talking about cultural sensitivity, the APA recognized that certain cultural and ethnic groups have been overrepresented or underrepresented in certain diagnoses. And this maybe in part to bias in diagnostic criteria. So that's why the DSM-5 cultural formulation interview is a tool. It's used by many mental health professionals just to assess how cultural values may be impacting a person's mental health. And it is part of the, the DSM-5. And it's a semi-structured interview and that ask about the person's cultural background, their beliefs, their values, and how those may affect their mental health symptoms. And it covers five pretty key areas here, like the cultural identity of the individual. And I'm not, I'm not big on reading slides, so my slides, so I'll let you kind of read that there. But just out of curiosity, how many of you have used this, this actual assessment? So, and again, this just helps you gain a better understanding of how cultural factors may be impacting that person's mental health and tailor their treatment approach to better meet their individual needs. So now again, we're, we're going to go over some of the most popular and open domain assessments. And like I said, there's thousands and new assessments and tools are constantly being developed and validated right now. And, and then at the same time, a lot of our tools that we're used to have become outdated or replaced by newer, better tools. So what we're going to do is go over some of the best 
tools that are not outdated. So I've got a lot of people saying, yes, I've used it. But a lot of people saying, no, there's no shame in that game because this is something not a, a, there. This is come out, but not a lot of clinicians are aware of it. And we actually have done a webinar on just this, the DSM-5 cultural formulation interview. We did a whole webinar on just this. So, and it, it, and we've got it, of course, in Iconodes. And so it's, it's really, it's interesting. Um, and we can even take a look at it later on. So I'd like to go through and show you some of the assessments. Now let's talk a little bit about um, depression assessments. As far as mental health assessments go, we could literally have a week long webinar talking about all the different scales and assessments and all the different features of the scales. But again, the scales I'm gonna talk about are scales that are publicly available, meaning you don't have to pay for them. And then we're gonna, we'll go, and again, I don't wanna get on a tirade on this, but a lot of companies have come out and said, look, we're grabbing copyrights and we're not going to charge for the form, which I don't feel is fair. I'd like to get your opinion on that. Um, but, you know, if you have any thoughts or opinions on that, I'd, I'd love to hear those. So, uh, again, all of these scales have demonstrated good reliability and validity, and a lot of them have been translated into many languages. So, now the PHQ-9 is that it's a standardized questionnaire. It's used to assess the severity of depression in adults. It consists of nine questions. It asks about the symptoms of depression and it's such things as like over the past two weeks, have you felt down? Have you had little interest, little pleasure in doing things? Are you experiencing sleep difficulties? So, and each question has four answered choices. So, and it's really considered a reliable and valuable valid tool for assessing depression. Now the PHQ-A is for adolescents and that can be used for ages 11 to 17 and it has 11 questions okay and about the frequency and severity of mental health symptoms and both of these use the likert scale and they they just are specifically in the phqa are tailored to adolescents such as questions like school performance and peer relationships and there are listen there's new phqs out and the, there's a PHQ-2 out now. Now I will tell you again, we're only going to talk about things that are reliable, right? And valid and the PHQ-2, it's two questions, has not got really good results. So that's why that's not on here. Look, is it quicker? Absolutely. And one of the things when we're talking about these assessments, I'm gonna tell you the time periods that it takes to complete these and also if they can be self-administered or clinician administered because because clinicians you're very very busy and a lot of times and and listen there's nothing better than a clinician sitting down with the client or patient and going over one of these assessments because you really can get a feel when you ask them the question of their responses you can see their facial expression their body language all of those things that give you clues as to what's going on and really help with a very thorough assessment but it's also very easy to get a patient or client to go onto the portal fill out a phq9 and you get their score right and that doesn't maybe eat into some of your time. And as a clinician, it's your preference on which way you want to do those. You can sit down with PHQ-9 and, and actually administer that, or it could be self-administered. They fill it out on their own. They don't need assistance from you. And the questions on the PHQ-9 are pretty easily understood by most people, and they can be completed in a, a pretty short period of time. Like some people can do it in only just a few minutes. So so that's one of the nice things. And it, the PHQ-9 has high internal consistency. So, and it's an open domain. Now, if you're dealing with individuals who are older and this, the GDS, the Geriatric Depression Scale, that is for individuals that are 65 and older. And it takes into account the unique challenges and experiences of aging and it consists of 30 questions and they ask about the presence and severity of depression symptoms of feelings of sadness guilt worthlessness loss of interest and each question has a yes or no response so it's not a likert okay and the higher the scores indicate the more severe the symptoms of depression and the gds is designed to be self-administered too and 
it usually takes about five or 10 minutes for an individual to complete on their own. It, it, it's a little quicker, even though it has more questions because of the yes and no. So now there is a GDS long form and that contains 15 additional items. Okay. And it is much more comprehensive and it also takes a lot longer to, to, to complete. So the GD, if you're like, well, what's the difference between the GDS regular and the GDS long form? The, the GDS long form is typically used in research or sometimes in clinical settings where there's a more detailed assessment is needed of their depression. So this is also used in farm studies. Okay. So long forms are generally, if that's one thing that you're thinking like, well, what is it? Long forms are a lot of times used in farm studies. So not always, but I just want to throw that out. And somebody said in private, what is a farm study? These are for um, testing new pharmaceuticals that are coming onto the market or attempting to be brought onto the market. So that's a lot of times what long forms are. So what I'm saying is the average clinician is not going to normally use a long form. So, but, but if you're involved in research now, again, big thing, the Zung depression rating scale, um, this has 20 items on it. It assesses the variety of symptoms of depression, like guilt and sadness and hopelessness, um, and then appetite on there. And each item has four response options that range from like a little bit of time to the most of time. And the questionnaire typically takes about five to 10 minutes, okay? And then the Hamilton. So the Hamilton is, it's known as the Hamilton Depression rating scale, but is also known as the Hamilton rating scale for depression, just a little play on words there. And it's a questionnaire and it's used to measure, of course, the severity of depressive symptoms. And it was actually developed by the psychiatrist Mark Max Hamilton in the late 1950s. And it's become a very widely used scale. And so we've got, it's 21 items on there and it's um, a zero, like a zero, a two, or a four, depending on the item. And so the max you can get on it is a 54. All right. Now the Hamilton is typically administered by a trained healthcare professional. So that, that is one thing. And the Hamilton could take up to 30 minutes to complete. It's considered a more comprehensive assessment than some of the other scales. Like the Hamilton is obviously more comprehensive than the Zung. Right. But it, it's also used in a lot of clinical trials to assess the, um, the efficacy of antidepressant medications and psychotherapy interventions. So, And then the major depression inventory, it's a self-report, right? So clients can self-report on that. And it's used to assess the severity of, of MDD, major depression. And it was developed by the World Health Organization. And it has just 10 items talks about like sadness, loss, interest, fatigue, and it has six responses ranging from like never to all the time. And that can be completed in like five to 10 minutes. So it's simple, it's quick, and it's translated in a lot of languages and it's used in a lot of countries. Now, I wanna get your feedback. What do you think is the most used depression scale out of this list. Just like to get feedback from folks. And is there any of these that you have used that you really like? I'd like to get your thoughts and opinions. Everett says you've used this, the PHQ-9 several times. Yes. P Look at PHQ-9 just winning. It is winning on here. <laughs> that is an astounding. I've got Beck. Charlotte came in with the Beck. Look, I like the Beck. I do. There's just copyright issues with the Beck. So, but yes, but no, definitely. But the PHQ-9, uh, overwhelming. Great. Yes, that is. And if you wanted to know, if you were interested in, in wanting to know uh, which which one is the most uh, used, you would be right if you said the PHQ-9. So absolutely. All right. So great. Thank you so much for, for giving your feedback. I absolutely love it. Now, suicide assessments, I'm going to tell you of all my favorites of the assessments that I'm going to talk about, 
the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale is my absolute favorite. And there's some, or there's definitely some background or, or history on that, but it is a brief questionnaire and it's really anybody can administer this without any formal mental health training. That means if you're a police officer, a firefighter, first responder, um, it's just got two questions. Okay. It's got two questions. It takes two minutes and it is available in 114 different languages. And studies in multiple countries have confirmed that the CS, the, the, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale can actually predict plan suicide attempts. All right. The studies on this are mind blowing and they come from everywhere. So the validity of this within the studies just cannot be denied. And that's why regulatory agencies like the Joint Commission recommend using this assessment. And when I first heard about this years and years and years ago, and they're like, anybody can do this assessment. I thought, well, then it can't be that great if anybody can do it. But it is that great. It is absolutely amazing. And the questions, the way it poses the questions about the way you feel as far as being suicidal, is so subtle. It's so non-judgmental, but absolutely accurate. Absolutely accurate. So I cannot brag on this assessment enough. It breaks boundaries compared to other assessments, okay, because it's used universally, it's anyone of any age, We they have a military assessment out, so it can be used in inpatient or outpatient or emergency department settings, so it can be used with those who have no previous mental health history to those that are suffering from SPMI, um, and SPMI, that's severe and persistent mental um, health illness, so this the CSSR, and there are multiple, multiple versions. So there is the lifetime rating scale. There is the recent rating scale. There is the since last visit rating scale. There is the self-assessment rating scale. So, um, th so they do have a self-assessment. All right. They, this is this is one of the kind of newer ads with the self-assessment. The most commonly used is the recent. Okay. The most commonly used is the recent. And this is one thing I really encourage people to do, especially, especially if you have individuals who are chronically suicidal. Um, at recent is a great assessment tool for them. So, and it's always important to assess for suicidality because if you have a situation where, and this is very unfortunate, so, but if you have a situation where a patient or a client of yours does commit suicide. And I'm just telling you this from my, my background, because my background is I actually uh, used to work for, for, for several years, a law firm um, in the Southeast. It's one of the largest law firms, and um, we represented clinicians. We, so if you're a patient and you came to us and you were trying to sue a clinician, we would not represent you. We represented um usually large organizations, outpatient organizations, and hospitals for um, with mental health, all types of representation, but mental health was where I worked. And I worked there as their expert. And, and so basically we review charts and documentation. And that's why documentation is so very important because it's, it's the only thing that you have. Okay. If you have to, if you ever find yourself in a liability situation, and unfortunately a lot of people are practicing what we like to call defensive medicine right now, um, because liability is really high in the United States. And that is not uh, an opinion. That is a fact. And um, unfortunately those rates are going up and not down. And that used to be that if you worked in mental health, that you didn't really have to face a lot of that because there was a big stigma with mental health and people just didn't sue and kind of what happened, what they, they they just didn't really talk about it. Now, wonderful thing, the stigma for mental health is decreasing significantly. But when you see that, there is a correlation with liability for clinicians increasing. And so a lot of times if someone has harmed themselves, um, they will say, well, did, did you assess them for suicide? And uh, sometimes saying, well, we talked about it is not enough. Um, and the questions on the CSSR that you can ask the patient or client really quickly, uh, 60 seconds, you know, are, are fantastic. And you're using a valid and reliable scale. So if you ever find yourself in that situation, I hope none of you do, then you could say, I used a valid and reliable scale. 
it's and you know it's it is the most recognized scale for suicide. So again, I'm going to get off of this hot topic. I've bragged about this enough. So just interest, do any of you use the CSSRS? Maria says, yes, exactly. All right, excellent, excellent. Okay, gonna keep moving on. Anxiety assessments. Interested to see if you use any of these? And do you have a favorite? So the depression, anxiety, stress scale, it's a self-report questionnaire. It's used to assess the severity of symptoms related to depression, anxiety, or stress. And it was developed in Australia and it's become widely used and because it's self-administered. And so, and they, it, it's very, it's a very, very good scale. It contains three subscales within each seven items. So, and it's a Likert, it's a Likert scale. Now, the 21, there's a 21 and a 42, okay, but, and they differ basically in the number of items and also the subscales used. So, the shorter version consists of the 21 items with the seven items per subscales, and it makes it a lot quicker to administer and score, and it, and that's pretty convenient, right? So, but it may be a little less sensitive to subtle differences in symptoms, whereas the the 42 is going to be the much longer version. It's got 14 items per subscale, and it makes it useful in clinical contexts where there's more detailed evaluation is necessary, but it's also going to be more time consuming and potentially less convenient. And one of the reasons that I talk about the ones that are quick to do is because a lot of these, especially if they're self-administered scores, your your patients or clients, they may be really engaged in the first couple of questions, right? They may really think about them and be very engaged in them. But when you get to like 42, sometimes your patient or client is just checking off boxes, right? Maybe not even reading the assessments because we're human. Right. Sometimes if I get involved in a very long survey for customer service at the end, I'm just checking a box. OK, like if they did great, check in the box like the question may not. I'm not really paying attention to the questions. And I think that we're all human and we're like that. And that's why I'm really a proponent of shorter versions of scales. But again, the PHQ-9 is a good example of, look, the PHQ-9. Well, PHQ-2 came out with two questions and we thought, well, that's going to be a lot more convenient and people, that's really good. Um, and you think, well, if the CSSRS can do it in two questions and really get that high validity, then the PHQ-2 should be able to do that. And that's not the case. Not all scales are created equal, right? And and so that's one thing. So the, the DAS-42 is just, it's got a lot going on. The GAD-7 is a self-report and it goes over the uh, assessing the severity of generalized anxiety. And it's brief, it's widely used, it's based on the diagnostic criteria and the DSM-4, um, and it just has the seven items. And participants basically rate each item on a four-point Likert, like not at all to nearly every day. And there, that's a, a lot of things I like about the GAD-7. It's brief, it's easy to administer, it's reliable, and so really, really good scale. Hamilton Anxiety Scale, it's a clinician administered questionnaire that's designed to assess the severity of anxiety symptoms. It, it's an oldie, so um, the Max Hamilton did created the scale in 1959. Um, it's got 14 items, but it does talk about things like tensions and fears and insomnias and even somatic complaints. So, and you can range, it ranges from zero to 56. And what I'm going to say about this with the Hamilton is because it's clinician administered, it's going to be more time consuming and resource intensive than a self-report like the GAD-7. So, um, but the Zung anxiety scale is self-administered as well. And Mr. Uh, Dr. William Zung in 1971 created this and it's used in clinical and research settings, has 20 items. It talks about nervousness, tensionness, or tension, excuse me, tensionness, not a word, F fearfulness, nervousness, and tension. Um, and so a lot of good, good things there. We'll jump ahead. Sorry about that. So one of the things, which, which one do you guys 
have you used the most? I'd love to get your feedback. Love to get your feedback on which one. Someone's asking about age assessments. If, if I don't say child, it's not for a child. So, the, okay, we've got some variant here. GAD7, the DAS, GAD7, Zung. Great. DAS and Zung. Got a lot of GAD7s. GAD7s kind of winning out here. I, I will tell you the GAD7 is the most commonly used, okay? So of all of the assessments that I'm going to go over today, the most commonly used are the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7. Okay. So, but great. And it's nice to see people using a variety of things. It really, really is. So, but now I want to talk about trauma because this is something we're assessing more for now. And I've got these broken down between adult and child. So the, this is one thing, the International Trauma Questionnaire, it's a standardized self-report. And it has been based on the diagnostic criteria for the PTSD um, in the 11th edition of the ICD-10. And if you're like, wait a minute, I only know about, I, or excuse me, 11, 11. And you're like, I only know about 10. ICD-11 is the, that's what's being used kind of around the world. It is coming to the United States. It will be here. It will not be here for a few years, though. If you, I have a lot of mix in here. We have Iconotes folks, and we have um, folks that are not with Iconotes. If you are with Iconotes, do not worry. We will help you get through the ICD-11 changes. Not, it will be a seamless process. Okay. So, but ICD-10 is here now, but ICD-11 is coming. So, but these are basically participants um, will rate the severity and the ITQ of, of on a five-point scale. Okay, and so, and it goes from zero to 88. So that is one of the, the things that, now, I will tell you that this particular one, I want to give a disclaimer on, the International Trauma Questionnaire, because it's a self-report scale, and it's really, it's relatively brief, and it's really easy to administer for clinicians, but a lot of people will take this scale and actually administer it as a clinician themselves. And the reason why is that individuals may find these questions on this particular questionnaire distressing or triggering if they've experienced uh, trauma in the past. So it really is recommended that it be administered by a trained professional who can provide like appropriate support and guidance to any individuals who may start to experience distress, distress during this questionnaire. The, the PCL5, that that one is, it's a 20 item, it's a self-report measure. Um, it was developed to align with the criteria for PTSD in the fifth DSM-5, right? And it includes four symptom clusters like intrusion, avoidance, negative alterations, cognitions and mood, hyperarousal. I don't feel like, and it's not just me, this is not opinion-based, this is study-based, that the PCL-5 is as triggering as the International Trauma Questionnaire. So, and so that's, you know, but I did want to give a kind of a disclaimer about that. If, if you're thinking about like which one is better for the ITQ is more appropriate for use for international multicultural settings because it was developed to be culturally sensitive and applicable across different languages and cultural context, but the PCL-5 is probably going to be more appropriate for settings where time and resources are limited because it's relatively brief. It's easily to administer. It can be self-administered and again, not as triggering as the other. Okay. All right. Child assessments for trauma. We've got some really good one. If you're using any of the trauma assessments, I'd love to hear what they are. Love for you just to post in here um, what what you're using. The CATS is a good one. It's a brief self-report. It's designed to assess trauma, exposure, and symptoms in children and adolescents. Um, and in Iconotes, we have the ability in our program to direct that toward the child or the caregiver. You can toggle between the two. 
and it consists of 10 questions that assess the range of trauma exposures that includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, witnessing of violence and accidents. And so, and it just really goes over like intrusive thoughts, avoidance behaviors and hyper arousal. And it's, it's easy uh, to administer. So, and it has good psychometric properties. So the high sensitivity and specificity for detecting trauma exposure and PTS symptoms in children. So really, really good on, on that. And I think it's widely used in clinical and in research. Um, so see the child PTSD syndrome scale, really good. Um, the traumatic events screening for children, this is for ages 6 to 17, and it has 20 items, and it assesses a range of PTSD symptoms, and it's brief, it's easy to use, it can be done in about 10 to 15 minutes, it could be self-administered or administered by a trained professional. Also has good psychometric properties and high sensitivity for detecting trauma exposure, okay, um, and it really identifies at youth, like at youth or at risk youth, excuse me, um, and helps you kind of be more informed in developing trauma-focused interventions. So, and then there's the ACE. Now, I know which one you're thinking, which one is used the most? Is it the child PTSD syndrome scale, the trauma symptom checklist for children? Um, those are the two most widely used measures for children and adolescents who have experienced trauma. Those are the two most used. But I, I, I want to throw the other one in here that has a little bit of controversy, but it's the ACE, okay? It's the Adverse Childhood Experiences. And that is for individuals who have experienced that during childhood, typically for the age of 18, and it's physical, emotional, sexual abuse. And it also goes into like household dysfunction and other types of adversity, like you witness violence, you witness substance abuse within the household. And that, this study, the ACE is a landmark study conducted by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser Permanente. They kind of came together. They linked the childhood adversity to negative health outcomes later on in life, like chronic diseases, substance use, um, mental health problems. And so that is, the ACE is really a tool to measure the individual's exposure to those adverse childhood experiences, okay? And it can go into parental separation, divorce, things like that. And so just, I thought that's a, a tool to bring up, a good one. And I see a lot, so I've got some people, Benson says the ACE, yep, Charlotte ACE, yep, Maria ACE, very good. People have their favorites and that's great. That is great. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about mood disorders. I'm going to speed up because we are running out of time, but we have a lot more to go. So the mood disorder questionnaire is a screening tool, and it helps people identify individuals who may have symptoms of bipolar disorder. So it's 13 questions, takes about five or 10 minutes to cover, talks about a little bit about changes in mood, energy, activity levels, sleep patterns. And one of the things, it also has questions about family history and the impact of um, those symptoms on the individual's life. So I, I like that one. Let's talk about the most frequently used one. You guys type it in. You tell me what you think the most frequently used is. I'll give you, type that in, about 10 seconds. It's the young. Okay, it's the young. It was developed by Dr. Young and a lot of colleagues of his. It has 11 items for sleep, for racing thoughts, for impulsivity. And, you know, the higher the scores on it, the more indicative that means of severe manic symptoms. So now the mood and feeling questionnaire is a self reported and it is used to assess symptoms of in adolescence between eight and 18, okay? And it has 33 items on it. It talks about like sadness, low mood, loss of interest, feelings of worthlessness. So that's one for, for kids. And then the bipolar spectrum diagnostic CL, it's a self-report measure. Again, love self-reports, consists of 19 items and zero to four scale on them, okay? Higher level scores, because it can go up to 76, indicate higher levels of bipolar disorder symptoms. All right, so I, Phyllis, I like the rapid mood screening. I do. 
I do. Um, I like those. Again, what we're going over is open domains, so. though. But yes, there are a couple that you guys are mentioning that I really am fans of. I really, really am. I want to talk about cognitive assessments. Uh, first off, the six item cognitive impairment test, it's a brief cognitive screening tool and it consists of six questions. So it talks about like cognitive domains, orientation, memory, and attention. It's quick, it's easy to administer. If you're doing telehealth, you can do this one, okay? And it's reliable and it's valid, so. Again, it's not a diagnostic tool in itself, but it is reliable and it's valid. The other three for cognitive assessments, the many mental, you know, people have to write a sentence so that that can be difficult. Um, the mini cog and uh, the Montreal cognitive assessment. These are all really good assessments, all copyrighted, all copyrighted assessments. OK, they have proprietary um products. So, and again, I'm going to say this, the politically correct response is copyright protection can provide an incentive for further research. I'm trying to be really nice when I say this and development in the field of mental health assessments, but the revenue generated by the sale of copyright um, assessments could be reinvested in the development of new assessments, but then they also charge for those assessments as well. <clears throat> so a lot of assessments you can't get to, it's behind a paywall, right? You have to go in, do the assessment online behind a paywall and pay for each individual assessment. That's super frustrating. So especially since these assessments are older assessments, the last three that you see, but the six item cognitive impairment test, not copyrighted. No one's going to charge you for that. And there is no drawing of a clock or writing of a sentence that you get with the other exams. And so it is like something that you could do with telehealth. So. All right, personality disorders. <clears throat> there are a couple of really good ones out here, but these are the ones that I want to uh, actually want to focus on. Uh, the borderline personality screamers uh, screener. It's a self-report, okay, and it was developed by researchers to provide like a brief and reliable measure of the BPD symptoms. So it's got 23 items on there, like identity disturbance, um, instability, impulsivity, unstable relationships. So it takes about five to 10 minutes for the individual to do. It also depends on the individual's reading speed and their level of self-awareness. Okay, so that is one thing. So those times will vary. Um, but the other is dissociative experiences scale. This measures the dissociative experiences in individuals. Um, that's where an individual has a disconnection from their thoughts, feelings, and memories or their sense of identity. There's 20 items on there. Okay, there's 20 items on there. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes for someone to complete that. Now, the next one is an international adjustment disorder questionnaire. This is the newest of the personality disorder scales. Just came out in 2019 and it's a self report and it's designed to assess symptoms of adjustment disorder. So, and then the, the, inner, the well, let's talk about the PD-5. We have the PD-5, there's one for adult, there's one for a child, okay? It's a self-report and it assesses personality traits according to the model outlined in the DSM-5. So, and I, I think these are really, really good. Um, it's, there's a lot of, I like all of these, the Waller self-description inventory. I think we need to talk about this a little bit. This one, this is, you can use the, between children, and adolescents, between age, age eight and 16. And it really is designed to use or talk about or assess various aspects of like self concept, self-esteem, um, social competence, emotional st stability. Here's the thing. It's an older scale. Um, so it takes a little bit longer, okay, to 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 do. And when I say a little bit longer, I'm talking like 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. So now there's also some other scales that I want to talk about really quickly. We'll kind of blow through these, but these are great scales and not they're really wonderful scales and not a lot of people use them. So we have the flourishing scale, which is a self-report and it measures the, the well-being of a person. Okay. Um, and it has eight items on there and it talks about like engagement activity, social relationship, overall so, sense of well-being. The Penn State Worry Questionnaire, I think this is a fabulous scale. Okay. It's 16 items. 
each item is rated on a five point scale. So really, really great scale. Um, the Kessler is also a fantastic scale and it's used a lot in research studies and also in clinical settings. Um, but it, it really is used to screen and, and more, not only screen, but also monitor treatment progress, okay? It's an excellent scale. If you're not familiar with the scale, I encourage you to go in and look at that. The quality of life is a really good scale too. It, it just looks over like your quality of life, physical health, emotional well-being, social relationship, also self-administered. And then the satisfaction with life is a widely used self-report questionnaire. And this is a great scale. It has five items and it really asks respondents like their level of agreement with statements such as my life is close to ideal or I am satisfied with my life. And those, I really like the questions in this scale. Again, really valid scale. And then the scale of positive and negative experience. Also very good scale. scale you, you can use it um, over a period of time. So it, it's basically was developed to provide a brief and reliable measure of positive and negative experiences. And then the scale, so it's really, really a good scale. We don't have a lot of time to go into this because I'm running a little bit low on time. Does anybody use these kind of quality of life scales in your daily practice? I'm seeing that the quality of life. Yeah, that is one of the most popular ones. Kessler's actually popular too. Penn State Worry Questionnaire. That's a great, that's a, a wonderful, wonderful scale as well. Now, I want to talk about substance use assessments. I think this is really important. Um, there are, the gain is in there. It's a super brief scale. It's, again, the questions on the gain are, are non-judgmental questions. Okay. And it's really designed to assess the person's substance use and related problems to that. Um, the cage, big fan of the cage. Okay, really big fan of the cage. We have um, the cage and the cage aid are very short, simple questionnaires to help the individual. So really, really great there. The Michigan alcohol screening test, great. And then a lot of people big fans of the brief addiction monitor. And as you can tell, I'm kind of like toning down a little bit what's in these. Now, if you're with Iconotes, we also have the ACM. So that's a huge assessment. And uh, the, the ACM is a wonderful feature and we have treatment plans. So for that, based on that as well. So, all right, all right getting good feedback here. Thank you guys so much for your feedback. This is good. Now I want to talk about family assessments. The marital status inventory, this is really good if you're doing couples therapy. So it's designed to measure the quality of a marital relationship. Um, it has 38 items. It's a five point scale and they're divided into subcategories like communication, conflict resolution, sexual satisfaction, emotional intimacy, role orientation, and life satisfaction. So it's it's really reliable it's really valid um and you, yes you can use it to assess your own marriage i would be cautious about all these wonderful assessments though <laughs> so as clinicians we like to do those on ourselves right so uh the parental stress scale is uh, also a really wonderful family assessment and it has 18 items on there and it talks about like feelings of incompetence as a parent role restriction, social isolation, lack of personal time. So, and you can take this one too. Now, um, so now I want to tell you, if you take this scale, because a lot of you I know are going to jump in and take some of these scales. So this one, if, and understandably, studies with parents of children who had developmental disabilities had reported high levels like mean scores of 40 to 47 that indicated high levels of stress related to parents parent and parenting and studies of parents of typically developing children had reported mean scores of about 28 to 36 so that's moderate level of stress okay if you score less than a 28 good on you okay good on you so, but um, you were doing something really, really good. But these assessments are very interesting to 
to to utilize on our ourselves. There's also some functional assessments I want to talk about. The um, the daily living activities really great. It's 20 questions. It's quick. It's reliable. And it's mainly functional ability. Okay. Now the functional assessment rating scale is a tool that used it's used to evaluate the patient's level of functioning in different areas like social, occupational, um, psychological functioning, and it's commonly used in mental health settings to assess the progress of patients and how they're going um, or over, uh, going through treatment. <clears throat> so. Eating concerns, the eating disorder screener for the DSM-5, okay? It is a self-report. It's designed to assess the presence and severity of eating disorder symptoms. It is specifically designed for use with individuals aged 13 and older. It takes about five to 10 minutes to complete. This is a valid and reliable skill for eating disorder. So if you're like, well, I don't deal with a lot of individuals that have eating disorder, but I do have some in my patient population, this is a wonderful scale for them. Mini nutritional assessment, I've got to put it up there, but it's really only valid for individuals that are 65 or older. So if you are doing, uh, your main patient population is geriatric, this is a really good assessment, okay? Also, if you're having to attest to MIPS, and if you don't know what MIPS is, that is a wonderful thing. But for the individuals on here, I saw we have some providers on here, prescribers, you're dealing with patients that um, are Medicare patients, this is something that you really want to take a look at when you're going over BMI, if they hit them B those BMI thresholds. Okay, MIPS, that could be a whole nother webinar. It is a nightmare. And so if you don't have to attest to it, be very, very happy. ADHD assessments, I want to go over this really quickly. Um, we have the Winder Utah Rating Scale and the ASRS self-reporting for these. And so the winder has 61 questions, all right, 61 questions on it. So that's a lot of questions, especially when you're trying to assess ADHD. Okay. Now, the, the, the second assessment um, is the adult self-report scale, and it has 18 questions so on it. And so that is one thing that, you know, is is helpful. I'm interested to see what you use for your ADHD assessments and then developmental assessments. So we have several diagnostic scales on here. Um, the first one is it's it's only it's short, it's self-administered, it has 14 questions. It's based on the DSM-5, which again, I as you can tell, I've said that several times about cer certain assessments, a big fan. If they're in the DSM-5, they're holy. Okay, so that's one of the things. The second questionnaire is uh, also 14 questions and it's typically completed by individuals themselves, but it also could be completed by a patient or caregiver. And it's about 10 to 15 minutes to complete. Okay, and so now I want to go to questions and I wanna show you some of the assessments that we have in Icono. So I wanna see how I'm running. I've got three minutes, okay. Vanderbilt, look, Andre, I like the Vanderbilt. I'll be honest with you, I do. Um, how are you feeling about all these assessments? If you hung in there with me, you went through 60 assessments. You learned about 60 assessments today. <laughs> so in this one hour, so you have done a lot in this one hour. If your brain is a little fried, I definitely, understand that. So absolutely. Phyllis, that's a really good question. Uh, we are currently working on getting web uh, CMEs for the webinars. So that is my goal for the next quarter. So that is my goal for the next quarter. I do want to show you some of these assessments. Um, we have in Iconotes really quickly. So if I can do that, I'm going to just reshare my screen. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys are you guys are wonderful. You're absolutely wonderful. I want to just show you what the assessments look like in Iconotes and also how you can build them in your notes. So I'm just going to go into forms and assessments. We have all of the forms and assessments in here in Iconotes, like the not all of them because we don't have thousands of them, um, but we do have ones that we talked about, like the Winder and the Waller. And yeah, I didn't even go over some some of these, like the safety with the CSSR. I just hit like there's our quality of life, there's our PHQ-9. So one thing, and this is really benign, but it's like one of my favorite things, is in Iconotes, the, it will actually start 
to when you're doing these assessments will actually populate the scores for you. So really, really great. It'll populate the scores for you. It's silly, but it's, I love it. Um, also in Iconotes, if I'm going into, and let's say I'm doing an assessment on an individual and I'm going to go into a therapist note and let's say the individual is just um, they're having symptoms of depression. So I'm going to, with Iconotes, you know, our content will populate for you. You can obviously type to your heart's content, but I could say, look, their depression is present and it's uh, maybe it's daily and the mood lasts for hours. And I could talk about how their appetite is poor and that's present and they're irritable and that symptom continues and they have libido is decreased and that's present. And I can talk about suicidality. They're not suicidal. Their denial is convincing. I can go into behavior. I can talk about verbal content, like maybe there are things going on. Maybe they're having problems at work and they're having depression there and low self-esteem. And then I can talk about what I'm going to do for them. So my session goal would be that we're going to work on coping skills. All right. And we're going to work on self-esteem and our interventions here are I'm going to encourage them to vent their feelings and give them support. And then here we have rating scales. Now, this is the great thing about rating scales. If they did a PHQ-9, on the portal you you have we have the rating scales on the portal for them they did the phq9 and they scored a 13 i can come in here and mark that they scored a 13 and then when i compile this note and i save this progress note it will continue to save my scores for the phq9 so there's my note I've got a great note, took me no time to do it, right? And then when I go into the chart face, we have a log section and I can actually start to see them trend over time. So I can go to rating scales log and I can see that there is PHQ-9 trend there. So absolutely. So really, really helpful within the system to incorporate these scales within your everyday everyday assessments with the individuals. So thank you <clears throat> so, so nice. Melinda, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. Um, I, I appreciate you guys. We do, we do have the handouts. If you want to use, I had someone um, just private message me. If you want to use the, the content in this webinar, you're more than welcome. Just contact me. So that's just contact me before you do it. That's not a problem. Um, and so absolutely. Stephen said, great comment, Stephen. Great comment. Well, again, thank you so much. I, I hope this was helpful. Um, I did get one other question. How do I find scales to use with this population, especially for depression, anxiety? Erin, I'd love to work with you because there are a lot of great scales out there. Again, I went over the most popular ones, but I think we could work together and really find some good scales to fit into for, for your particular uh, patient or client population. So absolutely this webinar is been recorded it will be shared with you so and i appreciate you guys um just hanging in there because we went over a lot of information so thank you so much and i hope everybody has a wonderful day thank you i'm going to put my email right in here into the this is my email address it's just october at iconotes.com all right thank you guys so much have a wonderful day thank you